A couple things just to announce uh, real, real briefly. Um, don't forget, young adults, uh, this is post-high school. Uh, there is Thursday nights now, 6.30 at Isaac and Sarah's house. Make sure you get there. See them uh, for more information. And the next few weeks, we're going to be putting out all the stuff for all the life groups and all that good stuff. So uh, look forward to that coming out. We want to launch that in the fall and get everybody connected even more. So with that, let's pray and we'll get going. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to again to come to your house and to spend time worshiping you. So Lord, we pray that today we would uh, spend time just praising your name and then looking at your word and having it really change how we view things so that we can be more and more like you. So go before us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Just uh, thank you this morning, Lord. Thank you just that you came down and saved us, Lord. And Lord, that as your word is open, Lord, that we you just reveal yourself to us, Lord, that you speak through Duane, Lord, that our hearts may be changed, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. We're continuing in our series of what in the world is going on. So we can try to put some sense to it. And I read this story, as you're turning to Mark 13, I read this story of a young pastor. He was quite energetic, and he had a small church in the country. And he was preaching on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he was quoting the words of Jesus from Revelation 22. And he moved up to the edge of the platform and shouted, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Then his mind just went blank and forgot what he was supposed to say. So he moved back and repeated his last statement as he rushed to the edge of the stage. Behold, I come quickly. Well, he moved back and he couldn't remember still what he was supposed to say next. And so, with even more gusto, he rushed towards the front of the stage and shouted, Behold, I come quickly. And at this point, he lost his balance, fell into the deacon's lap in the front row, and he looked up and said, Sir, I'm sorry. And the deacon looked at him and said, Don't worry, you warned me three times you were coming. (laughs) The reason that story was fun is it also really is important to note what we looked at last week. 
Jesus warned us that He is going to return. That is a sure thing. And so we understand that. Now we're in the 13th chapter of Mark where Jesus talks about the future. And that's why we're calling these three messages what in the world is going on. Because unlike weather forecasters who sometimes get it right, Jesus is forecasting the future. And it will be spot on all the way through. Now in the first message last week, we looked at the events that Jesus predicted that have already come true or are coming true in our time frame. We, know, we noticed that the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. His followers have been being persecuted. And the Gospel is being preached all around the world. Now, in this passage that we're going to look at today, the message Jesus is, is giving us is He's telling us about things that have not yet happened. They are in the future. Now, I want you to understand the, the, the setting here. Remember, he's speaking these words to his disciples, and it's really hours prior to his arrest, his trial, and then ultimately his crucifixion. His crucifixion. So with that, let's stand and we'll honor God by reading his word. Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom He chose, He shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there He is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be dark, be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven." Lord, I pray as we open this up that we have a right understanding of what's to come and how we fit in it. And so Lord, I pray that we would cling to Your Word during these turbulent times. In Your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. From a kid on, I've, I've always loved history. I love studying it. I, I think it's just fascinating because it, it combines the study of events, but also of, of human nature and of leadership. Uh, but prophecy, when I look at prophecy, it's history in reverse. We know history from beginning until now. But I want you to hear this from Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. God says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. It's important to note that Jesus is God. And in this passage, He is pulling back the curtain to give us a glimpse of what's to come, the future. So we're going to explore three truths that Jesus mentions here. The first is there's going to be a time of global chaos. But prior to that, Jesus takes home His bride church if you noticed in mark chapter 13 jesus said for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that god created until now and never will be that's in verse 19 now let me give you a very simple timeline of end time events as i understand them now i, I want to caution you i have yet to read anybody that i agree with 100 percent there's a lot that we don't necessarily understand completely. 
So you always have to, when, when anybody like myself goes, here's what I think now. My view on eschatology has changed over the years. And it's important to note that. So just understand, this is what I understand at this point. The very next thing that will happen on the prophetic calendar is the end of the church age. That's the rapture of the church. Now this is when Jesus will return in the clouds and quickly snatch away His bride, the church. That's us. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ. That's the key. That is the key. There are a lot of people that sit in church that haven't given their life to Jesus. They're the ones that the book series left behind all for. Because they're going to miss it. Now, He will take us to his father's house. Now, Jesus doesn't talk about the rapture here in Mark chapter 13, but Paul writes about it several times. And I'm going to mention it because it is the event that ushers in this period of global chaos. You may think we're in global chaos now. We're not even close to what it will be. Now, the word rapture doesn't appear in the New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes exclusively on Jesus coming back in the clouds. He won't touch down on the planet. There will be a shout and the sound of a trumpet, and the bodies of the dead in Christ will be raised up. Then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Now, have you ever thought about what the rapture is going to feel like? I've experienced it. I got hit by a 6'4", 305-pound defensive end in high school, and I've never felt my feet leave the ground so quick in my life. And from that point on, I thought that's what it's going to feel like. Just instant air. It's going to be this amazing thing that will happen. Now, this idea, this phrase, caught up, in the Greek is harpazo. But in the Latin, it's raptio. That's where we get our modern day word rapture from. Now, Paul writes... It's going to be in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead shall be raised and corruptible, and we shall be changed. And at that time, millions of believers who comprise the church, the bride of Christ, will suddenly disappear worldwide. It's going to be amazing. Think about this. In the moment's notice, twinkling of an eye, you are going to be going about your business, and up in the air you go. Praise God, I can't wait can't wait to see that and be part of that. Now, this event will be the most catastrophic supernatural disaster to ever occur to this point on earth. But I want to caution you, it is not a supernatural disaster. It will be a supernatural departure. The reason I used disaster is, can you imagine the chaos that's going to occur after? Can you imagine how many cars are going to be without a driver? How many airplanes without pilots? How many trains without conductors? I, I mean, can you imagine? It will be millions worldwide will disappear in the blink of an eye. And what they're doing, whatever it is they're doing, will still be in movement. That will catch everyone's attention. I guarantee it. Because of what will occur as a result. This ends the church age. And it ushers in a new time. And this time is often referred to as the tribulation. And it's referred as the tribulation because of the King James Version of the Bible. Jesus used that word in their translation. It's in Matthew 24, 21. So I'm going to read it to you in the King James Version. Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Look, there have been terrible times in history. There have been plagues, pestilence, famines, drought, bloody wars. We've all seen that in our lifetime. I remember as a kid in the 70s, seeing every time on the nightly news the, the pictures of people starving in Ethiopia from the famines. It, this has gone on and on. And as awful as that is, as awful as some of the wars that we've experienced in even our lifetimes, the loss of life, it's going to be nothing to what's coming during this period called the tribulation. 
Jesus said that this particular time would be more terrible than any previous in history and more horrific than any time after. Aren't you glad we won't be here? I, I, I don't know about you, but that makes me want to be gone. When you compare this scripture with Daniel and Revelation, most scholars believe the tribulation will last seven years. The first half of it won't be very bad. But then the last three and a half years will be the most awful time in the history of mankind. Now, John describes uh, this chaotic tribulation in, Re- in Revelations chapter 6 through 18. There are seven seals to a scroll that are open, and each seal leads to a kind of judgment on the earth's inhabitants. Then seven trumpets are sounded, and each trumpet announces harsher infliction. And finally, depending on what version of the Bible, vials or bowls of wrath are poured out. I have seen lots of folks trying to connect COVID-19 to one of these things in Revelation. Now here's the problem. The numbers don't match. Because in most of those things, it talks about a quarter of the population of the earth, which would be in the billions that die. See, I think whenever we try to take and move things and make it to where we want it to fit, that's a mistake. What does God's Word say? As we looked at last week, birth pains. Yeah, things are getting little bit crazier and they're getting harsher but it's not billions dying we're not there we're in these birth pains now about this time you might be getting a little nervous because you're thinking you don't want to be around for these terrible things on planet earth don't worry if you love jesus see this is why the pre-rapture of the church is so important And this is why sometimes Christians drive me nuts with their worry over eschatological things. If you look at Scripture and you see the pre-rapture of the church, why are you so wigged out about all the stuff that comes afterwards? If you read Revelation, I want you to take particular interest in chapter 1, verse 3. I want you to, that's your homework. I didn't say that the first service, but... I'm going to say it to you. That's your homework. You know what it says? Read and be blessed. See, the whole point of this idea of prophetic word and for knowing what's coming isn't to wig you out. It's to give you a right understanding of what's to come so that you can have faith in Christ. That's the whole point. And next week, we're going to move into this whole thing of what do we do now? Because it's important on how we go. But if you're part of the church, meaning you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're part of His bride, the church, and you're not going to be here. Now, how, why am I convinced of this? I'm going to give you a couple reasons, and it's in Scripture. One reason is that when you read the book of Revelation, the church is mentioned 26 times in the first three chapters. But then... During all the chapters describing the terrible tribulation, you never read the word church once. The church is only mentioned again in the last chapter when we are the church eternal with the Lord. Now, Jesus, in writing to the churches, chapter 3, verse 10, He gives us a promise. Because you have kept My word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world Try to try those who dwell on the earth. Isn't that a great promise? I mean, let's, let's, let's keep that in our minds. Because that's where we want to understand. From the moment of the rapture until the rest of eternity, do you know where we'll be? We will be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes uh, that we will meet the Lord in the air. And then he adds at the end of 17 and 18 these words, And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. See, the whole purpose of this prophetic string of events that are shown is so that we can encourage one another. It's okay. God's in control. Here's what's going to happen. But we see so much fear in Christendom today wrapped around what's going on in our world and in prophecy 
And it's because we don't know God's Word. This is meant to encourage us. This is meant to help us live a life that's holy and acceptable. It's meant to allow us to have joy and peace in times like this. And so that we can share with others, which is next week. Now the second thing is during this time, a global leader will stand in the temple and demand to be worshipped. Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus said this, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. After the church is removed, you can imagine the global chaos that will ensue. I mean, think about it. It's going to be craziness. There will be a clamor for someone to lead. There always is. No matter what disaster, catastrophe, or something, people are looking for someone to lead them out. And there will be a a world leader who will rise up and bring all the nations together in a one world government with a global economy. We already see the movement of that stuff. And it's important to understand Now Daniel calls him the king who is to come. The apostle John calls him the Antichrist. And then in Revelation, he's known as the beast. Paul calls him the man of lawlessness. This leader will bring the remnants of nations together into a global alliance. Many people have been talking about a one world government for many years. But there's one of particular note. He was the CBS News anchorman for decades. He was well respected in his journalism. And in 1999, Walter Cronkite spoke at the United Nations and shared his dream of a one world government. He said, to do that, of course, we Americans will have to yield up some of our sovereignty. It would take a lot of courage, a lot of faith in the new order. Walter Cronkite died at 92, but until his death... He was pushing for a global government. You can Google this and you can actually hear his speech. Here's the thing. We see that happening already, don't we? People ask me, why aren't you getting riled up about all the civil liberties that are being taken away? Because of God's Word. Do you think that's going to happen all at once? It's happening now, guys. And it's been happening for decades. Now, does that mean we don't stand up and vote? No, we do that. But we need to understand that this is going to be a progression of things to where at the time of the Antichrist, people are going to be clamoring, yes, take away our rights. The first time that I started getting concerned about this was after 9-11. That's when the changes really started to take form because we were scared. and We gave up some of our civil liberties at that point. See, it happens in a progression. And we need to understand that that's happening. But here's the thing. Encourage one another with these words. It's part of God's plan. And He's going to take us out before it gets really bad. So, please understand that. Now, Jesus spoke about the abomination that causes desolation. This is a sacrilegious action that will be carried out by a global leader. Daniel mentions the abomination that causes desolation three times. And here's what he predicted in chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come come one who makes desolate until the, the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So we know this. The Antichrist will first appear to be a peacemaker. He will broken broker a seven-year covenant or a peace treaty. We don't know the parties involved in this treaty. But we kind of do. Let's be real. Now this is conjecture. Please don't take this. This is conjecture. We know that after the rapture of the church, the rest of the prophecy is for Israel. Okay? It's all about God's chosen people and bringing them back. So, where has every president in my lifetime been trying to To solve world peace, the Middle East. And it always involves Israel. In 1948, after World War II and the atrocious things that occurred to the Jewish people, 
the world established them back in their homeland. It's been nothing but problems since. This makes sense. That, they would, that the, the Antichrist would broker a peace treaty between the, is, is, the Israel and a moderate Muslim leader. I don't know that we're seeing that yet because it's down the road. But that could happen. Now, the abomination that causes desolation will take place in the Jewish temple. So you're saying, wait a minute, Dwayne, there's no Jewish temple currently. True. But if they got the green light, the Israelis could construct a temple overnight. They could build the same thing that Moses built in the wilderness. A tabernacle, which was a tent. The Jewish tabernacle wasn't large. The canvas fence around it was 150 feet by 75 feet. But the actual tent containing the holy place and the holy of holies was only 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. Those dimensions didn't change when they built the larger walls and buildings around it. Think about it. 15 feet by 45 feet is the size of a single wide mobile home, roughly. Most of our homes are larger than that. This isn't a big deal. Many of us are waiting to see this occur. All of the instruments and implements for a third temple have already been constructed by a group of Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem. They've been playing around for decades to get the right red heifer without a blemish. And I have no idea if it's done or not. I, I gave up on that. You know? But... I'm sure they've moved forward. See, they are gearing up so that when this occurs, they are ready, boom, to put it there. Now, you're going, but wait a minute, the Jewish temple and tabernacle can't be rebuilt on its original location because the Muslims have the Dome of the Rock and it occupies the space right now. Sort of. It depends on which Jewish authority you speak to. Some believe the actual location of the temple was about 200 feet north of the current Dome of the Rock. So what if this moderate Muslim leader and this Jewish leader were able to, to look about at this peace treaty and the Jews and the Muslims would divide up this 36-acre temple mount into a Muslim section and a Jewish section? Then the Jews would be able to rebuild their temple. And I'm telling you, it would happen overnight. That would provide the place for the Antichrist to stand and do what Daniel and Jesus called the abominations that causes desolation. Now Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he says this, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That, my folks, is an abomination. Now, here is this man that's going to stand in God's temple and declare that he is God and that you must worship him. Now, when he does that, I can tell you what's going to happen. The Jewish priests are going to scream and holler and rip their robes and run out. And the Jewish people will walk out and they will never be in that temple again because of the abomination now leaves it desolate because it is unclean. Now, why should we be surprised? Here's the deal. Satan controls the Antichrist. What has Satan always done? Remember? He got kicked out of heaven because he was made the most beautiful instrument for worship and he decided that everyone should worship him. That she, he should be in the seat of God. Hmm. What did he do to Jesus in the, in the temptations? Trying to get Jesus to worship him. See, here's the thing. You can't be neutral in this. You either worship God or you worship Satan. One of the two. Now, the Jews will refuse to worship the Antichrist. 
I don't care what you call it, a megalomaniac, a narcissist, whatever you want to call it, you can put it in our modern terms, but they are not going to do that. And as a result, the wrath of the Antichrist and his government will burn hot against the Jewish nation. And over the next 42 months, three and a half years, the Antichrist will organize a huge army to surround and attack the Israelites. The Jews will be outnumbered a thousand to one. And the Antichrist will gather his armies at a staging a ground around 60 miles north of Jerusalem. We know this from Revelation 16, 16 as Armageddon. So we move on to the next thing. Jesus will return to win the final battle and establish his kingdom. We see it in Mark chapter 13, verse 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Whenever I read this, I can't help but remember as a kid, after the monster mash from 12 to 1, and I only did this in the winter because my mom wouldn't let me stay inside that long, but the afternoon, there were the old westerns. You remember them? They were all black and white. They were awesome. But here's how it always worked. There was two lines of story. It was either the showdown in the, in the main square at noon, or it was the showdown out in the prairie somewhere. And so when I see this whole thing that's going to happen with Jesus, what I visualize is this. You've seen it. The wagons are rolled up. The Indians are running around. They're shooting back and forth. The, the people in the wagons are running out of ammo. They think it's almost over. And you think, oh man, this is going to end weird. And then all of a sudden, from way off yonder, you hear the sound of the bugle. Sounding charge, and here comes the cavalry to the rescue. And they come running in, shooting, the Indians take off, and they save the day. Okay, you're getting a little trip in Dwayne's brain. But this is how I see the final battle. It's going to look really bad. It's going to look like nothing's going to turn the tide. And then, here comes Jesus. Returning just at the right time to protect his people. He's going to come with his forces. You, me. That's who's going to come back for this final battle. But here's the deal it's going to be a short one. So we're going to look at how. Paul, John, and Zechariah describe this final battle. I think it's important whenever you're trying to understand Scripture, you look at other Scripture. It's really a key. So, Paul wrote this in 2 Thessalonians 2.8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, excuse me, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Paul just says, look, he's going to show up and the Antichrist is just going to disappear. It's going to be over that quick. That's exciting. Now John wrote in Revelation chapter 19, he wrote a little bit more, he went into detail, verses 11 through 16, and this is what he wrote. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. That's us again. <clears throat> From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, the Old Testament even spoke to this. And Zechariah, here's what he saw in chapter 14. It's kind of a compilation of verses 3 and 4 and then verse 9. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as He fights in the day of battle. On that day His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley. That's the end of 4. Then we move down to 9. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and His name the only name. Guys, that's what I call a mighty victory. 
See, it's sure. One of the things that I, I, I want you to understand, this is why I drew your attention to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, read and be blessed. The whole blessing is to understand that the end is secure and that we are fine, those who love Jesus. The only weapon used in this final battle will be the words that proceed from the mouth of our glorified Christ. Now, Martin Luther understood this when he wrote his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Now, he dedicated a part of the verse to the downfall of the devil. This is what he wrote. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not at him. His rage can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. See, Martin Luther understood that that the battle was already over. It's done. We don't have to worry about him. Now, here's the thing that I... I want to kind of address today as we wrap this up. As we come back from the future to the present day, first and foremost, we don't know when Jesus is going to return. I told you over and over again, but I want you to heed the warning. If someone writes down a date of when they're going to return, I don't care how right on they've been. Otherwise, they're a heretic. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I am, and I don't know how exactly to express this, frustrated is the closest I can come to what I see going on in Christendom today. Everybody's wrapped up in all this garbage. They're talking about the mark of the beast. I've seen people so preoccupied with the mark of the beast. If you read your Scripture and you see that there is a pre-rapture of the church prior to the tribulation, Why are you worried about the mark of the beast? Good night. You need to know, but it's not going to happen. And even if it did happen, here's the thing. You have a choice. It's not going to be slipped into something. But here's the thing. When you read God's Word and you understand that the church, His bride, is raptured prior to this because the promise says, I'm going to take you out because you've been faithful then why are we so preoccupied with things that are going to happen after we're gone? Please, please be careful. There are some in Christendom that think we need to be wrapped up in this end time stuff all the time and be looking. You know, there's people that say, oh, the prophetic time clock, it clicked. Well, of course it clicked. Time is moving. Regardless of what's happening, we're one day closer. But here's the thing, when I look at Revelation, it says read and be blessed. When I look at Scripture and I realize that those of us in Christ Jesus will be raptured away before it gets really bad, then why am I concerned and worried about all that? And so if you're a Christian hearing my voice and you are concerned and worried about end time stuff, then there's one of two things that's going on. The first is, knock it off and have faith. The second is, you may not be saved. And that's blunt. But that's the reality. Why else would you be worried? See, what the Bible says is that a moment's notice in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to leave. Last week I told you, are you ready? That's the same question this week. Are you ready? Now what does that mean? That means, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? No, please don't misunderstand it. It is not about church attendance. Just because you attend church doesn't mean you're saved. Well, but I do more than that. I come to church, you know, and I give regularly, and I I really like... No, no. Have you given your life to Jesus? And here's what that looks like. When you give your life to Jesus, you serve Him. So that looks like this. Your life has changed. You no longer live for yourself. You live for Him. And what that means is, your life has changed. The things that you used to do, you don't do. The things that you thought were stupid before, you now love. And you're looking for every opportunity to share His grace and His mercy with the people around you. What it looks like is every decision in your life is based upon, is that what God would have me do? That means a move 
That means a change in jobs. That means if you're trying to get married, the person you want to marry, is that who God would have for you? It's every single decision in your life has to revolve around if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, all that matters is what He thinks and no one else. That's a disciple of God. If that's not what you see in your life, then I hate to tell you that. You've been religious and you have not accepted Christ. But you can. Because there's still time to be ready. And that's what it's about. You need to repent immediately and accept Jesus and heed the warning to escape the judgment that's coming. Because that judgment is going to be about sin. And here's the sad thing. We've all experienced it. We see some people who just laugh at the, at the Bible and refuse to heed the warning. I've been in church all my life. And one of the most tragic things that I've experienced in my lifetime in the church are people that are faithful in attendance every week and yet never have accepted Jesus. I don't get it. But I've seen it more times than not. So, final question for today. Are you ready for His return? Next week, we're going to spend time talking about, okay, now what? Now that we understand, what are we supposed to be doing? I think you've heard enough from me today to know where I'm going. It's time. As we see the birth pains coming closer together and more severe, this should spur us to start sharing Jesus and getting movement to build the kingdom of heaven. That's what we'll spend our time with next week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. And we thank You that it leads nothing to the imagination. It's all laid out. And so Lord, I pray for those that are hearing my voice today that really, regardless of whether they've been in church forever, or not, if they know that they need to be saved, Lord, I pray that they would ask You to fill their life and to come into their life now. And Lord, I pray if there are Christians that do love You, but they've been fearful, I, I pray that You help them stop that. To understand that You're there, and that all those things, while you know, we need to read them and know them, it's to read and be blessed, and to not be fearful of what's to come, because we have You. So Lord, I pray that You would help us to have a right understanding of this. and To not overdo anything in one way or another. So Lord, we thank You for this. In Your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for the final song. strong.
See, that's where your faith comes from, is understanding He's stronger. And that He will overcome everything. My hope is, as we finish this up, we'll be looking at what we're to do now, and then I'm going to give you some folks that I would have you consider to read. Just a few. Uh, there's so many out there that I can't keep up with all of them. Uh, and, uh, but there's a few that I think are solid, and I'll give you that next week as well. Because I think... It's something that there's a lot of interest in right now, and I see it as a great witnessing tool. Because people have all these questions now about Bible prophecy, and it's a great time to get in this conversation. Or people are saying, like, can you believe what the world is coming to now? As a matter of fact, I do. So that's the hope in this, is that this will give us this ability to share some hope of Jesus with people. So with that, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord bless you guys. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you all next Sunday.